Hey everybody and welcome back to some more Oxygen Not Included. We're about 20 cycles on from the end of the last episode and I've spent that time between episodes trying to fix and refine a couple of the smaller systems that we have around the base and I'll talk about those in just a second here but the big thing that I want to work on in today's episode is digging up and hopefully starting to do a little bit of building up in space, the very top level of the base, so we can start uh, unlocking the star map and we can start doing research with space and start working towards getting to our first rocket. And to do that, we have to do this research right here, Celestial Detection, which gives us access to the space scanner as well as the telescope, which is what allows us to progress on, get some of the uh, high level research here, some of this interstellar research uh, unlocked and to start working towards our first rockets. So we'll set that going, we'll let the research get going on that. And another thing that I would like to do right out of the gate here is pick a new duplicate because although things have been going pretty well up until now especially on the oxygen and the food front it's taking a little bit of time to get certain tasks done just because we don't have enough duplicates free from their kind of core tasks we've got so many core things that need to be done every single cycle like farming food and then cooking that food and then taking care of the hatches and the drekkers and delivering coal and other fuels to stuff like the coal generator there is just so much stuff that needs to be done that there is just so much less time for our duplicates to actually get some of the new stuff done, like the building and the digging and whatnot. And so real quick, we'll go ahead and we'll pick one of these two here. We've got Ren and we've got Ada, both of which have diver's lungs, which is fantastic. They're going to use a lot less oxygen than the uh, normal duplicates that we have. And it's essentially a choice between the all-rounder with machinery, medicine and strength over here and the kind of very focused in on science, plus seven science. I think I'm going to go with Ada just because... She doesn't have flatulence. Flatulence means that every so often the duplicate will quote unquote output natural gas. Now, if we could just put this duplicate into a room and, you know, just kind of basically treat them like a prisoner and push, you know, food through the door, give them oxygen and then just harvest the natural gas, that might be worth it because we do need quite a bit of natural gas. And between episodes, our natural gas geyser down here has gone dormant and we are out of natural gas right now just because our natural gas generators have been online so much of the time recently. And so we could do with the extra natural gas, but that's not the way it's going to work. The duplicate is going to be running around. It's going to be doing all kinds of stuff. And the natural gas that they produce is going to be almost 100% useless, right? It's just going to fill up at the bottom of the base like this natural gas here or like this natural gas over here. And it's not going to be something that we can really take advantage of. And so I think we're definitely going to go ahead and go with Ada here. She also has gourmet. The duplicate's refined palate demands only the most luxurious dishes the colony can offer. She also has plus three to cuisine, which means that she's faster at cooking food, which is good. And she has a decreased food morale bonus, which means she receives a morale boost from lower quality food. I don't know if that really adds up. These two seem like they're at odds with one another but nevertheless i'm gonna go ahead and take ada here uh print her out and get her to work real quick i will go to the research menu here not the research menu the priorities menu and i will bump her up for research that's what she's good at we might as well have her doing that as well that could also free up some space for uh, for stinky to do other things as well so i'll put her on high priority for research and i will also put her on high priority for food so that maybe we can bring mima down a little bit although she's very good at food we can have her work on you know building and digging and doing some of the other tasks around the base that she is uh, better suited to. So I'll hit play and I'll talk about some of the things I've done between episodes. The first thing that I want to talk about is this monstrosity down here, which looks a little bit more complicated than it is. So a few episodes back, we set up this system to begin cooling down our water to make sure that the base stays nice and cool and we've run into a couple of hiccups along the way especially since we allowed some of the very hot water that's coming from our cool steam vent over here to actually make its way into that system um, we've had problems with hot water making its way to the base or with the system getting backed up because there's too much hot water and so what i've done here is i've added some automation to try and make sure that this system runs all of the time so over here we have a shutoff valve on the incoming water and so essentially what we're doing here is there is a liquid sensor on the input to the first liquid reservoir and so if this liquid pipe here has water in it for more than five seconds we've got a buffer gate here so if this pipe here has water in it the liquid element sensor will output a green signal this not gate then turns that into a red signal and then there is a buffer gate so that if this is green for more than five seconds meaning that if there is water in that pipe for more than five seconds turn off the shutoff valve so don't let any more water into the system because if this pipe here is full for five seconds that means that we have too much water already in our reservoirs and we don't need any more water to come in so that's kind of a 
failsafe there to stop the system backing up completely. We then have this liquid sensor right here, uh, which essentially does a similar thing. If this pipe here is full, that means that the system is backed up and we don't need any more water in the base, at which point we have this not gate here and this buffer gate here. So that essentially, if there is water in this pipe for more than five seconds, we turn off the thermal aqua tuner and we stop water from coming in from the reservoirs, at which point they will of course back up triggering this sensor here and thus stopping the whole system from filling up with water. And so essentially, I think with this automation setup, this system should never get backed up. It should be able to continually work forever, cooling down the water, sending the water to be looped around if it's too hot, stopping water coming in if we've got too much water, and making sure that our base always has as much water as it needs, so long as there is enough clean water coming into the system in the first place. Um, in other news, I've also gone ahead and done quite a bit of work down here at the bottom of the base. I've gone ahead and made our petroleum tank yet bigger because we just seemingly do not have enough space to store all of the petroleum that we're generating right now. And I was thinking about potentially doing something with this sour gas, either storing it in a bunch of reservoirs like we've done with our natural gas, or uh, more likely I was thinking of just trying to store it all in a box like we did with the chlorine earlier in the series, using something like a high pressure gas vent to try and store it somewhere else. But there is just so much sour gas. If I hover over this here, you can see that we have 72 kilograms of natural gas per tile. That is a ridiculous amount of pressure that is built up in this area over here, especially inside this tank. It's uh, still quite bad outside the tank. Even 46 kilograms of, um, of sour gas is still very, very high. For comparison, the rest of the base is somewhere between zero and two kilograms. And so if I was to try and store this in a big box, the best we can do is 20 kilograms per tile using the high pressure gas vent. And so if we were trying to set up a room to store this, we would need two to three tiles per every tile of sour gas that we have here, meaning that we would need a massive room with the high pressure gas vent just to try and store all of that sour gas. And so for the time being, instead of doing that, I've just put a water lock in to uh, stop the high pressure sour gas from making its way out and into the rest of the base. In the future, it's possible that we could try and do something with potentially turning the sour gas into methane, which is a bit tricky to do. You do have to cool the sour gas right down to negative 161.5 degrees Celsius. But if you do that, you can then heat the methane back up and turn it into natural gas. And so there is um, a possibility that later on down the line, we could potentially use the sour gas here to produce more natural gas and kind of get rid of it that way. And then also, I guess, turn it into, uh, into water via the natural gas generators. But that is a problem for future Isaac. Um, other things that I've done over here, I've put down a little liquid pump because uh, as you may notice over here, we are slowly but surely running out of oil. I did also put down a uh, filter over here so that all of the uh, polluted and non-polluted water that uh, that is here doesn't try and go around into uh, these pipes. It did a little bit, which is why we have a couple of nearly broken pipes. And I can tell you that that is a bad idea because if uh, polluted water or even regular water makes its way around into these pipes, um, as soon as it comes through here, it immediately gets heated up to nearly 200 degrees Celsius. And then of course, instantly turns to steam and will break all of your pipes. So we've got a filter now that's being dumped in over here. I think what I'm probably gonna do here is get this liquid pump back online and simply connect it up to this pipe here because this area is essentially in the same situation as this one was. And so if we just repair this and then link it up over here, we can then have all of the oil from this area work its way around and get turned into petroleum. And then all of the water that's here uh, will get pumped around and stored in over here. And speaking of water, I've also gone ahead and set up a little carbon skimmer system. Um, very simple. We've got a water sieve and a carbon skimmer. And because the carbon skimmer doesn't actually use water, it just turns it into polluted water. We've just got a small little closed loop system where the water is sieved and then pumped around and then becomes polluted and then gets sieved and over and over and over again to uh, try and remove some of the carbon dioxide in this area because there is quite a bit of carbon dioxide coming out of the petroleum generator generator, which leads me nicely onto the main thing that I've been doing between episodes, and that is trying to work towards getting to a point where we can make a ton of steel. And by a ton, I mean multiple tons of steel. So um, essentially, at the end of the last episode, we set all of our core machines, that being the rock crusher, the metal refinery, and the kiln, to a high priority, and we set them to infinitely make the lime, the refined carbon, and the iron. And between episodes, I'm happy to report that we now have a lot of all of those resources. We have over 11 tons of refined find iron almost 11 tons of refined carbon and almost half a ton of lime. And so if we go ahead and set this to make steel forever, we should be able to make quite a lot of steel throughout the course of today's episode, which of course is necessary if we're gonna do that space building, which I'm hoping to get done before the end of today's episode. I've also done a little bit of just kind of general maintenance work around here. I've put in a couple of floors. I use a lot of mesh tile because 
this ice biome is still slowly but surely melting. And so in the interest of trying to get all of the water into one place and not just having water, you know, dripping down all over the place, I have uh, used mesh tiles so that all the water can just fall to the bottom here. And I've put a couple of other things in here like wallpaper, artwork, and a, a ceiling light that's of course connected to this uh, pressure plate here, which right now is always on because there's some stuff on top of it. Hopefully uh, they'll get rid of that fairly soon. And uh, this will just be on when a duplicate comes to use the refinery. But it's still not really doing much. The decor in here is still very, very bad, as is to be expected with so much machinery and so much heavy wood wire. And so uh, I don't really know if it was worth putting that stuff down, but nevertheless, it is there. And so real quick here, let me see if I can't go and get this liquid pump online because right now the pipe here is just full of polluted water. I'm going to turn this off real quick. I think we're pretty much uh, done for oil. We could get this little bit over here, but I think that's going to take uh, quite a while to come through. And so there's really no point right now, at least in pumping uh, all of this polluted water up into here. This is just going to fill up and uh, we're not going to be able to deal with it. And so what I will do real quick here is this filter. Real quick, I'm going to set these to like a, a priority nine. Hopefully we can get this, uh, get this fixed. Uh, this is online. It's just not connected to power. So real quick, let me go ahead and reconnect that like so. I did also... Uh, switch it up so that now everything that is below the petroleum generator is powered by the petroleum generator. There's a little uh, transformer right here turning that power into something that the regular wire can, uh, can stomach. So all of this stuff here is now powered by the petroleum generator as opposed to uh, our core network. And so essentially now the polluted water and regular water should make its way uh, right up into the base via this pipe here. That does mean we're going to have to disconnect this pipe here, but that's fine. We can make that happen. And then if we just reconnect this up like so, like so, and then connect that up here, like so. That should pump all of the crude oil up, around, over, and into either the metal refinery, or of course around and into the uh, petroleum generator room, or if it's water, it will send it up to the core of the base. And I also think for now, what I might do is delete this pipe here. That's going to stop the oil going around to the petroleum area until it's been through the metal refinery. That way we should almost always have uh, some form of coolant for our metal refinery. I am going to go ahead and uh, priority nine, please delete this pipe here. It's not a problem because I'm fairly certain this is just going up. Oh no, that is a problem. Okay, so, um, ah, I see the issue here. Okay, we need to reconnect this up so that the water has somewhere to go, uh, but we also need to get this oil out of the system. So also real quick, I'm going to set a priority nine break here. And then once that oil reaches the top, I will then go ahead and empty the pipe out a couple of times to hopefully get rid of that oil and not get it into uh, into our water supply. Uh, oh, perfect. It's going to go back down on its own, of course. Okay, so real quick, let me go ahead and uh, hook this up like so. And uh, that should get the oil back to where it needs to be. And so now, hopefully, we should have what it takes as soon as all of this water here is taken care of, which it can't be right now because this is over pressurized. And so real quick temporary fix i'm going to do something like this and like this and that should allow more of that polluted water to uh, to get pumped through out of the way and make room for the oil to come in so we can start making a bunch of steel once we have all of that steel we can actually start working on getting it to the surface and so let's go ahead and actually start digging up to space so we can actually get there for when we have that steel so i'm just going to schedule not that high of a priority we'll set it to priority eight for the time being but we'll set some priority eight ladders going up to, uh, to space here. So once we get up into space, we're going to need a couple of things. One of the things we're going to need is, of course, bunker doors. The bunker doors are nearly indestructible. They can withstand extremely high pressures and impacts. And so, as I mentioned in the last episode, we're going to have bunker doors that open and close depending on whether or not uh, debris from space, so meteors or just like showers of rock come down and hit the surface. We don't want those meteors and showers of rock hitting the things that we build. Otherwise, those things are going to break and we'll have to send somebody up there over and over and over again to repair them. And so what we can do is we can set up bunker doors that close automatically when debris is sensed. And that's what the space scanner is for. The space scanner sends a green signal to its automation circuit when it detects incoming objects from space, can be configured to detect incoming meteor showers or returning space rockets. So we can use that to kind of sense when debris is coming our way and then close the bunker door so that everything that we have up in space doesn't get, you know, destroyed. Now, on top of that, we also need to get ourselves some autonomous lasers. Now, I forget the name of the lasers that we need. They are somewhere on here. These guys right here, the Robo Miners, which automatically dig out all material in a set range. So the meteors or debris are going to hit 
hopefully our bunker doors, hopefully not our machines. And then once the meteor shower has finished, the bunker doors are going to open up, but all of that debris that is going to be sat on top of the bunker doors is then going to fall down onto our machines. That is where the robo miner comes in. The robo miner will be in charge of destroying all of that debris to make sure that everything can work as intended. For example, it's going to make sense for us to build a couple of solar panels up in space to get free electrical power for all of this stuff. And if our solar panels are covered with space debris, they're not going to work, they're not going to produce power, and so having a robot miner there to get rid of the space debris on top of our solar panels is uh, probably going to be a good idea. Uh, thankfully, we already have that unlocked, which is fantastic. Um, but one thing that we do need to get going before we can uh, build in space, though, before we can get those solar panels is the glass forge which allows us to produce molten glass from raw sand i believe it is here under the refinement tab and uh, if we look at the recipe for the solar panels it's actually quite a surprising recipe because it's made of just glass there's no electrical components there's no metal in it it's just glass 200 kilograms of glass per solar panel and so that is where of course the glass forge comes in uh, the research did just get completed uh, i am going to go ahead and set the next research going here so we can actually look into getting our first rocket in the next episode actually i'm going to untick that because i would rather um whoever it is doing research be working on other things like getting our steel made or potentially digging up uh, to this new area this is set to priority eight but i guess it just goes to show how busy the base is right now that no one has yet to go there but ada is on the job fresh new in the base she is a little bit slower than everybody else right now simply because she doesn't have um all of the skills that everybody else has and i think we probably do want to push her down this field research astronomy route. Not only is it the route that she likes, but if we look at the research for the telescope again, the telescope does require a duplicate with the geographical analysis trait, and you get that from the field research. Yeah, geographical analysis. And so um, having both her and Stinky being able to do that is going to drastically increase the efficiency with which we can use the telescope. And speaking of efficiency, we should probably move Ada down onto the second, uh, the second schedule here. Now, one thing they have added since the new update are these, um, like, sun and moon icons. So, Stinky, by the looks of it, is an early bird. So, he has plus two to all attributes in the morning. And so, really, we want Stinky working as much as possible in the early hours here. So, to accommodate that, what I might do is just move everybody back an hour. So, that they go to sleep here, they go to the bathroom here, and then they start work here. That way, we can kind of squeeze the most out of Stinky here. Not really squeezing the most out of Mima. Although I guess, again, we could offset our uh, our timings a bit more if we had like one, two, three, and then bathroom right about there, and then downtime, one, two, three, and work, one, two, three. That way we can take full effect of Mima's early bird attribute. Sure, why not? I don't think it really matters when we have them, them sleep, so long as we do have them sleep. I don't think there's any in-game mechanic where they actually prefer to sleep when it is nighttime. I think most of the base is uh, powered by artificial light anyway. Um, I did also tweak this room a little bit. I put down a space heater um, and got rid of our thermo aqua tuna for gases, which I've forgotten the name of. It is called the thermoregulator because uh, this room over here is now very cold. It's at 17.8 degrees Celsius, 16.8. Um, I did set these temporarily down to 15 degrees Celsius just to kind of give my thermoregulator something to do and to try and heat this room up. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work. These rooms are just now too cold for them to effectively heat this room up. And so I put in some temp shift plates to try and even out the temperature across this room. And I reinstituted the space heater here to hopefully uh, keep all of these pinch of peppers online. It looks like we might want to bump this up just a little bit to maybe like 37 because it seems to be uh, a little temperamental right now with some of these not being online all of the time. Although that does seem to be due to pressure more than temperature right now. Yeah, 20 grams of carbon dioxide is not a lot. We might have to put in some airflow tiles. I'm a little dubious to do so because then it's going to heat up the rest of the base. A better idea might be to try and pump some of the hot oxygen from over here into this room, potentially. But for now, I think it's doing okay. I'm not going to worry about it too much. The food supply is still going up, which is good. So the glass forge. Let's go to refinement and let's go ahead and throw one of these guys down. Uh, for now, right at the bottom with our metal refinery. I'm going to build this thing right about here so the glass forge is interesting in that the glass that it outputs is very very hot i believe it actually outputs the glass as molten glass and so we are going to have to have a pipe that comes out of here for to, to give that molten glass somewhere to go now i'm fairly certain that the metal forge does require quite a bit of power it does 1.2 kilowatts and so i think our best bet here is going to be to go with some conductive wire yeah so let's go i guess from i can i connect conductive wire directly to heavy wire I think I can, right? I've always been under the assumption that I can, but I also feel like we had an issue earlier where I had conductive wire burnout. Yeah, I don't think you can run it like that. I think it does have to have uh, some form of large power transformer between the heavy watt wire and 
the conductive wire. So in that case, we could try and just run the heavyweight wire up here, but that's only going to decrease the decor yet further. So I think what I'll do is I'll just delete uh, this wall here and push this wall back a little bit and put a heavy watt transformer somewhere right about here like this that is of course going to require a floor underneath it and just to keep things in line with the rest of the base i'll put some wall in there as well that way we can run heavy watt wire up and into here and then we can run standard conductive wire around and over to the glass forge that is going to require a little bit of a bridge but that is fine and one thing i did notice between episodes that i know the comment section has been telling me about for ages now is that we can actually make quite a lot of conductive wire at this point because the lead that you mine out at the bottom of the base here like all of this stuff right here is pre-refined so unlike the copper ore and the iron ore that we mine in other parts of the base the lead that you get here is already in refined form and thus can be used right away in the making of things like the conductive wire and you'll notice that we have got 45,000 lead ready to go and it's only 25 lead per wire here and so we can really be quite liberal with this conductive wire at this point if we need machines uh, like the metal refinery and like the glass forge that uh, that need more than a thousand watts worth of power so we'll get this hooked up now as i mentioned i believe there is a liquid output on this glass forge which is where the molten glass is going to come from and if i'm not mistaken i believe the molten glass comes out at just shy of 2000 degrees celsius yeah, you'll see it freezes into actual glass at 1,100. So we know it's going to come out above 1,000 degrees Celsius and then it turns into rock glass, um, which is a gas, at 2,300. So it's going to come out somewhere between these two temperatures, which is, of course, insanely hot. And it's going to cool down to a solid almost instantaneously, which means that it's going to break the pipes if we use normal pipes. I'm going to use insulated pipes. Now, there probably is a material that we want to use here. I would assume maybe granite with the overheat temperature of plus 15 might be the best choice. We don't want something that's thermally reactive. We want the heat to stay as uh, inside the insulated pipe as possible. Um, and we really want it to be dropped out onto the floor pretty much instantaneously. Now, I don't know if we can do that with a vent. I assume we can. I can't imagine any other way that you do it. So hopefully here, they put the sand into the glass forge. It comes out very, very hot. It stays hot inside that pipe until it gets dropped out. If it turns into a solid before it comes out, it's going to break the pipes, which is not the end of the world. It's, it's fine. It just means we have to keep repairing the pipes. But ideally, that would not be the case. Ideally, it would just come out and uh, turn to a solid after it leaves the vent here. So I'm going to go ahead and schedule uh, quite a bit of glass here. We'll schedule like 20 for the time being. That's going to get us about 500 kilograms. You know what? We'll do... I'm going to do even more. It might even be just worth setting this to forever right now because another thing that we are going to want to build out of when we get to space is almost certainly the glass tile, which it doesn't appear that we've unlocked yet. So real quick, uh, under research, we need to unlock this guy right here, the window tile, which is going to allow us to build in space whilst also allowing light to pass through and hit our solar panels. So we'll schedule infinite glass. I will also set this to a priority eight so that hopefully uh, somebody will come and make this glass. Uh, it does say a high melt risk. I don't know if there's much that I can do about that. This pipe is in danger of melting at the current temperature. I don't know if there's a better material that we can make this out of. All of the materials we have right now seem not great. There's obsidian, which could potentially withstand a little bit of extra heat, but it also is thermally reactive, which means it's going to require little energy to raise the temperature and therefore heat and cool quickly, which is not what we want out of an insulated pipe. We could potentially look at using tungsten. That might work. Tungsten probably has a pretty high overheat temperature. And especially if we make the inside of the pipe, it might might work. We'll see how it goes, though. I'll let them make a piece here. And if it breaks, we'll, uh, we'll look at replacing it with tungsten. Okay, so it seems to be working just fine. Like the molten glass comes out. And then as soon as it lands on the floor, it instantly solidifies into solid glass. We've got 100 kilograms of it already. I think because we're in such a cold environment, the pipes are not melting. Because they're starting so low down at, you know, almost zero degrees Celsius, it seems like they're doing just fine. It's keeping all of that heat in and then just dumping it out on the ground and then turning it into a solid once it hits the floor here. Not the most elegant way of making glass in the world. It looks like we are losing a tiny little bit of the glass because now we've only got 149.9 kilograms. But for the most part, I'm fine with this. As long as the system works and produces glass for us, I think this is fine. Um, I have gone ahead and disabled the kiln for now. We've got um, like 12 tons of refined carbon, 11.1 tons of refined carbon. And we only need 20 kilograms per time. And so for now, at least this 11.1 tons is more than enough. And uh, I would 
prefer it if we kept at least some of our coal available for the coal generators as when we need them. Uh, we do still have 8.5 tons of coal here, but that's down quite a bit from the 30 plus tons we had just a few cycles ago. And we are now using our uh, coal generators a lot more given that we're out of uh, natural gas. I think the natural gas generator is close to coming back online. Yeah, 3.4 cycles until that uh, leaves its dormancy and returns to, uh, to being useful for us. So hopefully we won't be using coal for too long here. And so essentially, guys, what I'm going to go ahead and do now is I'm going to go away. I'm going to dig up to the surface, which they have yet to start doing yet. They've not <laughs> dug up here at all. Um, although they are saying that's an unreachable dig, which is... It makes a little bit of sense because I don't think they can get through here. At the same time, though, we did see Ada running around here earlier, right? I'm going to schedule the digging of this Abyssalite real quick, and then I want to see if someone actually comes up and, uh, and starts building this ladder. I assume they can now get up here. That's still an unreachable dig, eh? Why is that unreachable? I just replaced it and suddenly it's not an unreachable dig? I understand that these were unreachable because they have to go through this one first, but now this one is no longer unreachable. Okay, so anyway, I'm going to go away. I'm going to get them all the way up to near the surface. We're also going to set up a little bit of a waterlock because, of course, space is a vacuum. And so if we don't use a waterlock, all of the gas in our base is going to slowly but surely rise up and just be deleted into the vacuum that is space. And so we'll dig up, we'll get our waterlock going, and I'll be back in a second to start building in space. Okay, so it is now cycle 579. We have got just shy of 7.5 tons of steel and just shy of three tons of plastic. But more important than any of that, we have finally found space. It is quite high up. There was a fair bit of digging uh, between where we were and actually getting to space. But I've gone ahead and set up a little waterlock here. I figured that instead of running a liquid pipe all the way up here with a vent, I'd just go ahead and throw the bottle empty down. In hindsight, it might have been a better idea just to run the liquid pipe up there because it did take quite a long time to fill up this uh, water lock here with the bottle emptier. But nevertheless, that gave them time to build this exceedingly long transit pipe, which now allows them to go all the way from the core of the base, essentially all the way up to space. And uh, they're almost done building that. Uh, I will go ahead and disable or deconstruct even the bottle empty here real quick so we can hook up this transit tube and have them get access right to the top here. And so essentially what we're going to do in today's episode is we're going to try and build a telescope that allows our duplicates to start mapping space, start finding where the planets are and start doing a little bit of research with that. That should unlock us the star map. Yep, the telescope can be found in the stations tab of the build menu. So once we get that down, we can start looking at the star map, start finding all the planets and whatnot. And then in the next episode, we'll look at potentially starting with our first uh, rocket. I believe that we need to build it with a steam engine, which is actually pretty nice. Uh, yeah, we have the steam engine here as we go on unlock more engines like the solid fuel thruster, uh, the petroleum engine, which of course is going to be very useful for us, and then finally the hydrogen engine, uh, which is why a little while back I uh, mentioned potentially storing our hydrogen for when we need the uh, liquid hydrogen for our rockets, but um, nevertheless, for now we're going to work with steam, and our steam vent right here, the one that outputs very hot steam, is next active in 34.4 cycles. We could use that if we need cooler steam. I have finally revealed this cool steam vent here. Uh, I was right, there was a second one. Very cool. We've got three steam vents that are all very, very close to each other, but uh, we could potentially use the steam from here, depending on when uh, this actually erupts next. We could potentially use that steam to power our rocket as well. But either way, we've got a lot of steam that is located very close to the top of the base. And so getting steam into a steam rocket shouldn't be all that difficult. But essentially now we're going to keep going up on this ladder and we're going to see about building our first platform, which for now we will build out of just a regular old tile like so and like so. And we will, of course, have our transit tube coming all the way up and dropping a duplicate out right about there. Nice. Okay, so the plan up here, I believe, is to have something a little bit like this. We're going to have our telescope, I guess for now, go right about here. We do need power up here, and that is where our solar panels do come into play. Now, as I mentioned before, there is a chance that the top of our planet here gets attacked by a meteor shower. And uh, I do have a little clip here of earlier when I was building up uh, to this area of, you know, some meteors and some debris just hitting the top of the uh, the top of the world here. Now, I'm going to set everything build-wise here to a lower priority real quick because I don't necessarily know where everything on this side is going to go yet, but I do want to do a little bit of planning here. So I've not done this before, by the way, so I'm not an expert by any means. But essentially what I'm thinking here is we want to have um, at least a couple of solar panels, like so. This guy uses, let's see, how much power? 120 watts, and these can produce, I believe, up to 340 at peak brightness, and I should point out it is very bright up here. Uh, right now, it is nearing the end of the day, so it's actually quite dark, and now it's pitch black, but 
as soon as the day starts and when we get to the midday, it actually becomes ridiculously bright up here uh, to the point where one of our duplicates, I think, are debuffed because it was like too bright. Um, so we might have to watch out and worry about that. But I believe at full power, these produce about 340, 380 watts of power. Now, one thing that we do have to bear in mind, of course, is that solar panels only work during the day. And so if we're going to want things running all of the time, which we are, we might want to store our power in, in batteries, right? And maybe quite a few batteries because the bunker doors that we're going to use to hopefully prevent all of our, you know, precious telescopes and solar panels from being destroyed do require 120 watts of power and do open quite slowly. And so despite that 120 watts being quite low, because they take such a long time to open and they're constantly using that 120 watts over the course of the time it takes them to open, they do require quite a large amount of power. And so essentially what I'm thinking here is we get a window tile and we're going to build that, of course, out of glass, not out of diamond. That would... Ah, Maybe diamond's not a bad idea, honestly. We've got 14,000 diamond and only 2,600 glass. But then again, we can make glass much, much easier than we can make diamond. So I think for now, we'll stick with glass. And we're going to build this pretty much just above the pre-existing level. Something like this. And then on there, we're going to have our new space scanner. So we'll have this guy for now, I guess, like right about here. We're going to have to tinker with this. Maybe move it a few times to see where is, where is best to put this. But for now, we'll put it right about there. And we'll see if that is, uh, is a good place for it. We will build some ladder going up so our duplicates can actually get up and, uh, and build this. And then essentially, we're going to have a couple of bunker doors. Now, these things do require half a ton of steel each. So uh, there's only 15 of these that we could make, you know, total if we wanted to. And so we do want a bit of overlap because the meteors and the debris and whatnot don't come straight down. They sometimes come down at an angle. So they could come in like this. And so ideally, we'd want this to go a fair bit over, right? Like a little bit over here. Then again, we don't have a ton of steel. And so for now, I think we are better off just kind of starting here and seeing how much we can build. And then if we need more, we can always build more as and when we get more steel. So we'll throw down a couple of bunker doors. I guess we'll put one here as well like that. At that point, we might as well extend out this platform just a little bit to incorporate the rest of that uh, bunker door here. We can also build this bunker tile, which again does require steel, but we can use that to kind of cover you know, the sides here. So if, if something does come from the side, we can use the bunker tile to uh, to stop that hitting our solar panel here. The reason why we're using bunker door and not uh, just bunker tile everywhere is because, of course, we do still need light to come through to power our solar panels. And if the telescope is going to work, that also uh, needs continued line of sight to the sky, uh, which now that I think about it is probably a good reason to not build the space scanner directly on top of it. I might put the space scanner like right there. There's a potential that does block this solar panel a little bit, but now we've got extra space. I guess we could shimmy those solar panels over by a tile or two, like that. Yeah, sure, why not? Let's set this to a priority eight. I do want this building here, and I do... Let's go ahead and set all of this to priority eight now. I'm pretty happy with this setup. So we're going to have something that looks a little bit like this. That should prevent any debris getting down to here because we've got this uh, glass level here, but that is where our auto miners are going to come in, and I'm not quite sure where those are utilities shipping apparently is where the uh, the robo miner is i would have thought that would be under utilities but nevertheless we want to have these guys ready to clear up the debris so all of the debris is going to land on uh, these bunker doors as soon as the bunker doors open that debris is going to fall down and land over here and so we really want to make sure that this entire top area is um able to be you know dug out so essentially i think if i'm not mistaken that these robo miners can either be destroyed or maybe overheat if they are like hit by debris and so i think what we want to do is actually cover the top of these with yet more tile so something like this to stop the debris directly hitting the robo miner that might seem somewhat counterintuitive but if we put two robo miners close enough together they should be able to get rid of the debris from on top of one another because of course as soon as that tile is built this robo miner is not gonna be able to get rid of the debris on top of it it's not gonna be able to have line of sight there but if we built another robo miner right about as soon as the safe is over, right about here, this rubber miner would be able to delete the debris on top of this, and then this rubber miner would be able to delete the debris on top of this as well. And so I think that is probably something we're going to do. If we do something like that, and then we have tile here, 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 and here. Now, I don't like that. I think we do very much so want our space scanner to be able to see space, like to have as much space around as possible. And so we probably don't want tile right next to it like that. All right, so once again, quite a while later, it took them so long to get all of these bunker doors built and we were hit 
by maybe four or five meteor showers along the way, which every single time would, would set me back so much. And so real quick, let's go ahead and rebuild this pipe here so our duplicates can get back to where they need to be. We'll set it to priority nine. Doesn't need to be the highest of priorities, but we finally have two solar panels, which are ready to work as soon as our bunker doors open up. Uh, more meteors on their way in, which is uh, fantastic as always. As I was about to say, one thing I did learn, the doors, the bunker doors cannot open or close without power. So this one is open, but I've set it to lock. It actually can't lock until it is powered on. And so we might, even though he's just set that to close, I don't think it can actually close until it has power. Oh no, it can. Just very, very excruciatingly slowly. Oh my goodness. Okay, so these definitely need power, right? Like, the idea of not running these with power is, is insanity. That's going to take so long to, uh, to close there. But everything else is pretty much up and running. We have the ability to make power. We are going to have to bring in some external power because, of course, we can't turn these on without opening these up. And I don't want to have to wait 600 years to open all of these up to get power in to kickstart the system. So instead, what we will do is under the power tab, we'll go conductive wire and we will just run some wire from our heavy watt cable here. We'll do what we did before. We'll set up a transformer probably right about there again doesn't need to be a top priority but priority eight or nine probably makes sense here we will of course put in a joint plate so we can run the heavy watt wire up and into here and then we'll just do something like like this and this set that back down to priority nine and then just run regular conductive wire from here up with the ladders and connect that up to the pre-existing system. Now, I have also gone ahead and thrown down a little bank of regular old jumbo batteries right about here. And the reason for that is that uh, we need to store the power from our solar panels. Now, we could have put them in space, but the thing about space is that it is a vacuum. And as we've seen before, if you leave something that generates heat in a vacuum, eventually and very quickly, it's going to overheat. And the reason why I didn't use smart batteries here is because we're never going to turn the solar panels off. We want them running all of the time. There's no need to set up automation to turn the solar panels off. They're not using a resource that we have control over. So it makes no sense to, to use them. And uh, these can store twice the amount of power in the same amount of space. So I figured we'd go for the jumbo batteries. And they're not in space because now they can transfer that heat to their surroundings. Whereas up here, they would just get hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter until they eventually uh, destroy themselves, which is, of course, not ideal. So once again, we'll go ahead and we'll dig this area out here. I did put more bunker doors here than I was originally intending to, but as more meteor showers came down, I, I realized we needed more of them if we were going to keep this whole area from being just covered in this um, regolith here, which ideally we wouldn't be. So we'll hook that up to the, the core of the system here and get power being pumped in. Once that power is pumped in, uh, we can then start opening and closing these doors automatically. So essentially what i think we want to do here is to send an automation signal when selected object is detected so meteor showers and so i think i think it should just be as easy as running automation wire from this guy up and across to every single one of these bunker doors like so that way as soon as a meteor shower is detected and hopefully it is detected well enough in advance it will then trigger these to all close we might have to put a not gate there because i have a feeling that a green signal is going to send these to open Yes, so I think if we go ahead and get rid of some of this and we put a not gate down right about there, that should hopefully tell these uh, bunker doors to close when meteors come in. Yes, that should be fine. Now, I'm still not 100% sad about these robo miners. I'm not, I, I don't know if this positioning is good. I feel like I'm just gonna have to see what happens, like test how this all works. Um, I did notice that one slightly annoying thing is that Things overheat very quickly, so the solar panels don't actually output any heat, which is fantastic. Otherwise, like with the batteries, they would just overheat into the point where they destroy themselves. And if we look at them, you'll see here that the solar panels um, turn intense sunlight into heat and produce zero waste. So they actually produce zero heat, which is good. But if this regolith hits them, the regolith comes in, you know, this is 188 degrees Celsius. If the regolith hits, it can then skyrocket the temperature of the solar panel, and if the solar panel gets too hot, it just keeps itself in a cycle of overheating so once or twice now i have had to delete these and then put them back down just because they once they start getting too hot once they have regolith on them there's i don't think there's a way to cool them down because there's nowhere for that heat to go so you just have to delete them and put them back so that might happen with the robo miners i think here i think what's likely to happen is that as soon as these bunker doors open the very hot regolith is going to hit them they're going to overheat very quickly and stop working and i think that's why we need these tiles above them like this now 
Again, the problem with that is that we have to have another rubber miner close enough to the existing rubber miner to delete the regolith on top of the tiles. And to do that, it looks like we're going to have to have rubber miners fairly close to the space scanner, which is not ideal. Although I think what might be the better idea here is to maybe move the space scanner up a little bit. That way it's a bit further away from the, uh, from the tile. So you know what? Sure, let me delete this. I'm going to try putting it just a little bit higher up. I'm also going to delete this Robo Miner here and maybe move it in a little bit. If there's one thing I've noticed, though, it's that dealing with space up here does seem to take quite a long time. Like, it takes our duplicates a long time to get up, a long time to get down. And so getting anything built, especially anything that requires glass or steel, which is pretty much everything here, takes so long because, of course, everything is being made essentially as far away as is humanly possible. It's being made right at the bottom of the map and needs to be taken all the way up to the very top of the map, right? This is the trek that our duplicates are going to make in order to get this stuff taken care of. Now, it's not too bad going from the bottom up, I guess, because they have that access point. They can just take a transit tube all the way up. But still, it's such a long distance, right? So I guess it does make sense here for us to put down another transit tube access point. And I think, as we saw before, putting it there should work just fine for them coming and going. Of course, that does require power, which hopefully our solar panels are up to the task of... Um, producing once we get the wire in place. Uh, they are taking their sweet time with the wire here, but again, I guess it's all probably made out of lead, if I was to guess. Yeah, and right now, all of the lead is right at the bottom of the base, and so they've got to get all the way down to come all the way back up to build this lead, and so it is going to take them a while. And so, once again, I guess I'm going to go away. I'm going to wait until we have... Oh, they've opened the doors here. Albeit very slowly, but they have... Oh, it's because of the automation wire, of course. So we didn't put down... Right, I see. That is fine. I guess, for now. Now, I'm thinking about the telescope as well here. I think the telescope really wants as much line of sight to the sky as possible, so I don't know how good of an idea it is to have this guy, like, like to have the rubber miners here, but I'm thinking about putting the telescope maybe right about there, right? If we have the telescope there, and we have it on its own little, you know, bit of window tile, then... This can reach all the way up here, so any debris that lands even close to this can be mined. Now, I don't know, though, if that's going to destroy the scanner, though. Like, I don't know if the, the rogolith that's going to hit the scanner is going to uh, cause it to overheat. But I don't really know of a way that we could stop that. I don't know of a way that we can not have rogolith hit the space scanner, because it has to be able to see the sky at some point in time. I guess we could potentially have this lower down. Like, it doesn't necessarily need to be this high up, right? If we had the scanner right about here, maybe? Like, that might work? I think it still might be too close to all of these machines here, and thus its effective, you know, ability to scan might be lowered. But I'll give it a try. I'll put it there for, for the time being and see if they can make that work. That way, we can just leave these rubber miners to break things on this second level here. So I'll set the uh, rubber miner to a high priority fix. Uh, we do... Of course, want to get that wiring taken care of, but they're working on that slowly but surely. They're also working on this wiring here. And so right now, it is pretty much just a waiting game. And once again, yet more cycles later, I think we finally have a setup that works. We were just hit by a meteor shower, and everything after the meteor shower is still here and still working. This guy did break, and also it would appear that this guy also did break. The question is whether or not did they break from overheating. This guy did break from overheating. You'll see he's currently at 55 degrees Celsius. So we are going to have to destroy and, and recreate this guy. I don't think there's a better way for us to do this right now, other than just replacing it. Because if you try and repair it, it's still too hot. Its temperature doesn't change here. Uh, it could be a problem that the stuff on the ground is heating it up, although I don't necessarily think so. One way that we could, of course, combat that is by having some auto sweepers that automatically clear the ground whenever things are broken. Yeah, I think that might be necessary because all of these are, uh, are starting to break here. So uh, it turns out, by the way, that you need multiple space scanners because uh, there is the scan quality, which is how good I believe this individual dish is at uh, scanning. So you'll see this one is 67% and this one is 75%. Not quite sure why this one's better than this one. I would have thought this one would be better, given that it's got less um, tile around it. But either way, there is then scan network quality, which is how good the overall network of scanners that you have is at detecting incoming meteors and asteroids. And the scan network quality determines how good, uh, like how long before a meteor hits, the scan will send out a signal. So in our case, it will send out a signal between 48 and 200 seconds before 
a meteor arrives. So in the worst case scenario, we're, we're made aware 48 seconds ahead of time. Before, when I had the one space scanner down here, it was at 0% because apparently they cannot see through the window tile, unlike the solar panels. And so at 0%, it was between 1 and 200 seconds. So the earliest that we would get would, would be like one second ahead of time, which is, of course, not great. And so now they're doing a little bit better. Um, Still not great, I guess. We could have yet more of these down uh, across the top of the, the map here to get a better idea of when meteor showers are incoming. But for now, let's go ahead and delete a few more of these because they're all overheating. There's no point in having them if they're overheating. They do all successfully dig out. I don't know if you might have caught that there before it went away, but they do also uh, successfully dig above the area that the other tiles can't get to. So, of course, this guy can't dig out whatever lands above him, which is why we have another one here to dig out this, and he can dig out what's up here, and the same is true on this side as well. Uh, that's why we have so many of them. Uh, the good news is that it seems like the space scanners will never overheat. So, despite the fact that they are getting hit by rock, no matter what, they keep going. This one's at 250 degrees Celsius and doesn't seem to have an overheat temperature. It does have a melting point, which I guess could be an issue, but I really don't know of any other way that we could stop the regolith hitting this. So for now, I'm not going to worry about it too much. We'll get to that issue when it uh, when it comes. For now, I'm going to go to shipping and I'm going to see about putting down auto sweepers in such a way that we can automatically pick things up here. Now, there is also the possibility, I guess, that the auto sweepers overheat. And again, I don't know if there's an easy way to, to not have that happen. Because if we put auto sweepers here, yes, it will be able to pick up all of the stuff along the ground. But at the same time, it won't be able to not get hit by the regolith. The regolith is going to hit it, it's going to overheat. So I don't really know of a way to solve that. And the fact that this guy is not overheating, despite the fact that there is very hot regolith here, me makes me think that maybe it's not the ground regolith that's causing the overheating. What I'm going to do for now, because this episode is taking forever, I'm going to put down uh, a couple of these scanners here. We'll set them to uh, priority nine, although I guess they're already done, so we'll just let them, let them build it here. We'll leave those for now. And uh, hopefully when the next meteor shower hits, they won't get destroyed. And then real quick, what we'll do before we finish this episode is we will go ahead and replace down the telescope, which was destroyed. And again, when it gets hit by regolith, it overheats. And so it, it essentially just can never overheat. Now, this thing does also require uh, an input of oxygen in order for it to work. There needs to be a duplicate uh, sat in there controlling it. And so we are going to have to get a gas pipe that goes all the way down to the bottom of the base here, which is quite the distance. And I, of course, do not need this to be a top priority. But I do ideally need this to connect up to our pre-existing oxygen pipe right there. Now, that is a lot of pipe, and that is a long way to go, but I'm fairly certain that our duplicates are up to the task. I will go ahead and uh, get rid of this, otherwise a couple of duplicates are probably going to lose some sleep over building that if they try and build all of that at, uh, at top priority. I think we probably do need some um, either more bunker doors along this way, uh, but what is more realistic, I think, is to have some bunker tile along this side here, you know, maybe something a little bit like this, just to stop any incoming meteors hitting this. It's not quite so bad on this side because the bunker door does go out a little further. There is a chance that something comes in like here, but at that point, it's really only going to hit this, which again is not great. We don't want our solar panels getting hit, but I don't really think that we desperately need something on this side just yet. And uh, quite thankfully, the regolith that we have here is kind of protecting the, uh, the transit tube access point. So for now, I'm just going to leave that where it is. Uh, but we do finally have the star map. We can see where all of the uh, the planets are going to be going all the way up to 19,000, 190,000 kilometers right at the top there. And so uh, as we put a duplicate in here, we're going to start scanning and we're going to find where all the planets are. As soon as we know where the planets are, we can then set course to them, right? We can get a rocket built and we can tell one of our duplicates to actually go to that planet to bring us back research points and also to bring us back some useful resources depending on uh, on where the planet is and what the planet has. Right now, we're just waiting for this pipe, which is very almost done, actually, which is fantastic. Once that's done, it's going to start sending oxygen through. And at that point, we should start to be able to, uh, to actually use this telescope. I'm really hoping another meteor shower hits before the end of today's episode because I would like to... Uh, to show you guys this system in action. I'm also going to build some ladder here just so they can actually get that bunker tile built there. We are running a little low on steel. We're down to uh, just 2.5, just, well, just two tons now of uh, steel, which is not a huge amount. And we will, of course, continue to make more as the colony continues to go on here. Our batteries are connected to the main grid right now. And so despite the fact that we do have solar panels, I don't necessarily think the solar panels are doing a lot of the work. Right now, it's probably mostly this stuff down here. Although, now that they're actually full, I think we can probably get away with disconnecting this. Because I'm thinking this should be enough power to run this system through the night. And the solar panels, hopefully, will produce enough power during the day to get us there. They're not 
quite producing the maximum amount of power. You'll see they're at like, you know, 200 and this one's producing over 200 watts. This one's producing about 120. Um, it is getting towards the end of the day now, so they are going to produce less and less. They do have stuff in the way, so they're not always going to produce max power, but they're doing pretty well. I think they're doing well enough to, uh, to keep everything here running. It's really only the space scanners that are online most of the time. Pretty much everything else here is situational, and we'll just run off of the... Uh, the pre-existing battery capacity. So this, I think, is pretty much ready to go. It does say reduced visibility. And actually, we might not need this guy, now that I think about it. Like, these two are more than capable of getting rid of what's on top here. So you know what? I am going to delete these miners. I don't think this one's needed either. Although I'll keep this one around just in case, you know, stuff does land here and does fall. We do want to make sure that's taken care of. We probably also want to put some kind of door here because otherwise uh, things are going to fall. Any regolith that does land is going to fall right down uh, to the bottom there. But we can do that in the future. But look at that. Visibility is 9%, which is not very high by any stretch of the imagination. We could probably do with getting rid of this ladder. The ladder is very much so not needed at this point in time. And probably replacing this here with um with window tile and maybe even this as well with window tile just to give this guy a bit more of a um a field of vision i don't know if it necessarily has to uh be usable this way like i don't know if this bunker tile is, is hurting us here and i don't know if let me check real quick can you like rotate the telescope no there's no telescope rotation i was wondering if we could have it like point this way so it looks like it doesn't matter this is just like a texture it doesn't uh, affect its its visibility i assume it has like a cone that it can uh can view so not particularly high, but we are going to start, I think, slowly but surely unlocking here. Analysis is currently 0% complete, which is not very high. I'm going to have to reconfigure this a little bit to get better visibility. It's also one of those things where it might be worth moving this up here, but I, I kind of feel like we have to have this below a window tile because this does overheat. And if it over, if it's up here, there's no way it's not going to overheat. So I'll have to uh, to tinker with this and, and figure out like what it is that I can do to increase the visibility. It might be the case that we just replace, you know, some of these here with, with window tile, like this and this. Maybe that will increase visibility. It could also be the case that we've got too much stuff near us here. Again, like maybe getting rid of the ladders and potentially getting rid of stuff like this. And maybe even like moving this transit tube over a little bit so it doesn't overlap with this guy's five tile radius. Okay, so a little while later and we've just got an incoming object detected so we can... Uh, slow down a little bit here and hopefully see all of this in action so the object has been scanned it's either 48 or 200 seconds away the bunker doors are closing uh, it turns out by the way that for this even if you have these window tiles probably the window tiles still reduce visibility and so what i'm thinking of doing here is getting rid of the window tile that is above the telescope and putting in another bunker door that's on a buffer gate so that Essentially, what hopefully will happen is meteors come in, or if meteors are going to come in, all the doors will close, including this one, and then these ones at the top will open, and then, you know, maybe up to a minute after the fact, this one here will open, so that we're going to give all of our rubber miners time to clear all the debris off, and then reopen this here, that way we should hopefully have the best kind of line of sight to the sky with this telescope here, something like this, and of course that can be priority nine. Still a little bit vulnerable on this side. You'll see these ladders not faring particularly well, but that's, you know, a very narrow bit of damage here, and it's only the ladders that did get damaged, so that's not a huge deal. The meteor is over. The bunker door's open. The debris falls in. Our telescope is going to burn, but that's fine. We can build another one. There was not much we could do to stop that, really. We need to get this bunker door built. I think I am going to have to move this robo miner over by one so we can hit this tile here, because right now, neither of these guys can do it. So I will go ahead and schedule the deletion of that as well as these window tiles here and most of these tiles by the way don't need to be window tiles at this point uh the only tiles that need to be window tiles are the ones that the solar panel looks through because it would appear that this is really the only building that can uh, take advantage of that so top priority please delete this i would love to not have to rebuild the telescope although as mentioned before it's going to just continue to overheat now because there's no way for it to get rid of uh, of all of that heat but right now its visibility is 36 percent which I think is pretty good. It's not ideal, but it's, you know, much, much better than the 9% was. So hopefully we'll be okay. I will get rid of these ladders. These might be causing a bit of a, a visibility hitch, potentially. I'm not too sure. I'll also set the rebuilding of this to uh, a slightly higher priority as well. But I think, guys, that for the most part, this setup is working pretty well. As soon as we get this moved over, and I guess we might as well just do 
Again, it doesn't need to be a window tile, so you might as well just make it a normal tile, not waste the glass. This doesn't need destroying. That did need destroying. We will move that over. Still not quite sure why Robo Miners are in shipping. I feel like they should be in utilities. And then we will get rid of those power wires as well. But I think the system is pretty much good. We've got space scanners, which with a pretty reasonable degree of accuracy are detecting when new stuff is coming in and then closing the bunker doors to stop pretty much everything here from getting hit. Once the meteor shower is over, the doors open up, everything falls down, the Robo Miners can destroy pretty much everything that is around us here uh, and so now if we go ahead and uh, delete this for like the seventh time today priority nine we will rebuild the telescope once more and hopefully this time it should be good to go now real quick though almost forgot i do need to put a buffer gate in right about here and then we need to have automation wire that goes from here over to here now real quick again i need to have the buffer gate after the not gate and so we could do some complex wiring, but I think I'm just going to put down another knot gate. They're not that expensive. So if we do something like this, and then we have a buffer gate like this, we can have the wire go down, across, and across. And that way, this door will do whatever these doors do, but just delay it. So if they are closed, this one will close, but it'll just close slower, which shouldn't matter because this, you know, this these doors here will protect the, uh, the, the telescope initially. And then these doors are going to open. The robo miners are going to get rid of the debris. And then after the debris is gone, this door will open up, or hopefully the debris will have been gone by the time this door opens up. We'll set the buffer timer to, to quite a large delay so that hopefully all of that is taken care of. The max is 200 seconds. I think that like 30 seconds should be enough. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't take them that long to get rid of everything. And so hopefully this system works as intended. Now, right out of the gate, our telescope is overheating, which is not ideal by any stretch of the imagination. We've still got that 36%, so the ladders don't seem to affect it. But what we might want to do is maybe put down a couple of storage bins here. And I should probably set my building priorities a little lower. But if we put down some storage bins, we can hopefully schedule the sweeping of, of some of this stuff here and maybe specify that we want regolith stored up here at the top of the map. So I've set up these storage bins here to store regolith and also to store the mafic rock as well which is some stuff that we've managed to find like down here and whatnot the only problem with sweeping this away which i've just scheduled a sweep here but there is stuff like iron and also other stuff granite and whatnot on the floor here as well the only trouble with ordering a sweep on that is that it's very hot even like the you know the iron here is is 205 degrees celsius and so if they can't store it in here i'm going to set this to all instead of just setting it to uh Regoloth and Mafic Rock, because what I don't want them to do is I don't want them to take this very, very hot iron and go and put it in a storage container, you know, over here. I don't want 200 degree iron in the, in the base like that. So hopefully if I schedule like a priority nine sweep of this area here, hopefully they'll move that into here. I think that that's all I can think of as being the issue here because there's otherwise there's nothing I can do about the, the overheating of the telescope. So once again, we are gonna have to deconstruct this because there's no way to get rid of the overheating issue without deconstructing it because there's nowhere for the heat to go unless we pump gas in here and build a room around it, which I also don't think is going to be useful. But uh, this is a good test for the bunker door, which hopefully is going to work. I'll let them sweep this up and then I'll rebuild the telescope because it seems pretty useless to do that ahead of time. But it looks like this is working. The real test will be if they manage to get rid of all the debris before the door opens back up. That guy is opening up very quickly. Like he's opening up in time with the rest of them. None of them have power, which is not great. That could be due to a broken power wire somewhere. Or just due to the fact that we've got no power, which is also not great. So it looks like we are going to have to rethink our solar panel setup. We might need more solar panels. I don't, I'm not sure because it seems like this was not, for whatever reason, this is not working. It, it doesn't matter too much. For now, we'll just go ahead and reconnect this like so. That will allow everything up here to continue working. And we'll just get a little boost from our solar panels. Uh, as we go forward, we can try and uh, configure this to be better in the future. For now, though, guys, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up today's episode there. It's been like 60 cycles since the start of this episode. And I spent so much time trying to make all of this work. For the most part, it seems to be doing pretty well. I'm pretty happy with the results. This door definitely still needs some work. Um, and next time, we can come back, reset up the telescope, and then look into what we need to produce a, a rocket you know try and harness the power of the steam both here and here and look at the pieces required to actually get a rocket off the ground but 
For now, guys, as always, if you did enjoy the video and you want to see more oxygen not included in the future, be sure to go ahead and hit that like button. It really does help out a lot. Leave a comment down below, subscribe if you're new here to get notified as soon as new videos go out. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.